and welcome. I'm Michelle Anderson of Clarinet Mentors. And I'm Sean Perrin of the Clarinet Podcast, clarinet.com. And we are happy to be here today to answer a bunch of questions that came in from clarinet players all over the world. This came out of a live broadcast that Sean and I did together on February 11th. We had about 70 clarinetists on and we just didn't get through all the questions. So if you haven't seen that one, we'll post a link in the write up below this video. Uh, to those questions and we have a bunch more to answer today. Absolutely there. Thanks everyone for submitting all those questions. It was really great. We had so many. It's, it's too bad we couldn't answer them during the, the time, but uh, that's why we're doing this. So I'm really happy to be here with Sean. Um, Sean, just in case people aren't familiar with you and the Clarinet podcast, why don't you tell us a bit about what you do? Um, so Clarinet is a weekly or mostly weekly show where I discuss uh, all that's new and neat with clarinet with uh, people in the industry ranging from manufacturers to artists to uh, kind of peripheral interests too, like hearing protection and, and things like that. So right now there's over 55 episodes and it can be listened to either on clarinet.com, there's links on screen there, or you can check it out on iTunes or if you use Android, you can use an app called Stitcher to access it. Um, but the easiest way for most people is probably just to go to the website and then you click the episode that you want and you click the little play button and it will play right then and there. That's awesome. And I, and I think if you haven't seen what Sean has, there's so many topics that he's covered that are of interest to so many clarinetists. So it's pretty easy to go through and find the area of interest that you have and, and then you'll get hooked and you're going to want to watch more. <laughs> <laughs> there's been some great artists on. I've had Martin Frost, uh, Harry Sparnai, Michael Lowenstern, Lori Friedman, uh, Michael Norsworthy, Maury Bakun, uh, all sorts of people. And I hear that uh, Michelle Anderson might be coming up as well. Um, da da da! Which will be fun. <laughs> coming soon to a coming podcast soon. near you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm Michelle Anderson of Clarinet Mentors. My mission is to kind of help people play the clarinet more easily and more beautifully, and I do that through online resources. So. I have a YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash clarinet mentors. I have a whole bunch of free videos on my website, www.clarinetmentors.com. And, uh, and I also love doing live events like the one that Sean and I did last, last week. And so I'm happy to be here. Um, I'll share more of my resources as we go through our session today. Clarinet Mentors is also awesome. Make sure to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Sean, we have a bunch of questions from people. Um, I think we should just kind of go through in no particular order other than the order people ask them and see what we come up with here. For sure. So the first one, are there any ways to improve speed of reading music and transferring notes to the clarinet? I have difficulty keeping up with accompaniments in the lessons. For example, should I concentrate on scales and arpeggios? That's a good question. That is a good question. Do you want me to start? Yes. Okay, so for that one, um, I mean, I'm sure lots of people have different ideas about how to increase your note reading speed, but I would really think about, I'm not sure how long you've been playing, but when you first start learning a language, like with English, you start by learning the individual letters, and then you learn how those form words, and then you learn how those form sentences, and then eventually you can write a paragraph and a whole, you know, article or a book or whatever. But you have to do the things kind of in that order, right? Um, the problem with music is so many people get hung up on just reading the notes. They never see the bigger picture. And in a lot of music, especially once you get to 16th notes and fast tempos, it's kind of impossible to continue working like that. Um, so for me, what I kind of advise is for people to start looking for the words and the sentences in the music. And although you do need to know the letter names, um, when I'm looking at fast music or any music, really, I'm not really thinking like A, B, C, D, E. I've just kind of learned where they are in my instrument and I can, I can interpret larger chunks. For example, you might see a pattern on the page that happens, you know, four times in a row. And there might be, if it's 16th notes, that would mean, I don't know, maybe there's a hundred notes there, right? But if you can see, oh, it's just a repeating F major arpeggio pattern, then it's only one piece of information. So I would look for the, the larger themes and sort of like the musical sentences within what you're looking at. And that will help you to, to increase that speed. There's also no substitute for just doing a note speller book and, and daily practice reviewing the note names and fingerings and, and just having them like that. So that's my thought. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Sean. And I, to me, I think there's two aspects to seeing music on the page and then being able to have it come quickly out of our clarinet if we want to play quickly. And 
One is this idea of patterns. I think there is a part of our brain that um, learns patterns and it's very powerful because it comes, becomes somewhat self uh, unconscious that we just, once we've learned a particular finger pattern or rhythm pattern or a tonguing pattern, when we see it again, we no longer have to think about it. So we program those patterns by repetitive practicing consciously as part of our warm up, doing finger patterns like scales and arpeggios, doing tonguing patterns, you know, clapping hard rhythms until they feel really easy for us. And I'm not sure we're consciously analyzing, oh, that's that F major arpeggio. Yeah. It's like our fingers just kind of go, oh, I've done that before, and they move into it. Do you know what, Sean, you reminded me of something I do with my students, so I'm going to put you on the spot and use you as a <laughs> it's an uh -oh. It's an illustration of how powerful the patterns are in our brain, and because you use language, I'm going to do that. So I'll say to someone, I'm going to show you a word, and without thinking of it, I want you to read it out loud. So here's your word, Sean. Make the word easy. Bandu for talite. Oh, you did that so well. Bandu for it to light. There it is. So <laughs> have you seen this word before? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I, I had not seen it until you started talking a few minutes ago. And yet, um, it's so easy for us to process that because, you know, if we actually analyze what your brain was doing, you probably know band. You know, you've seen words with the ooh sound and fort and uh. So it's a combination of syllables that we've learned and we're familiar with through years of speaking and reading. And so when we put those familiar patterns together in an unfamiliar combination, which is like a new piece of music, you still read it pretty effortlessly, you know, even though I was putting you on the spot. And I think music's the same way. Our, our sight reading becomes that easy when all those patterns are really familiar to us. Yeah, no, I should have said that the patterns should become almost as automatic or as automatic as the note names themselves, right? But if you're, if you're always hung up on the note names, you'll never get to those patterns. And one other thing that's interesting is, is with that word that she just showed me, for example, um, I didn't have to look at that and go, B-A-N-D-O-O, -O. like I was able to just look and see the sounds without interpreting the letters. And that starts to happen with music too. You see a, a, some sort of, I think I said F major arpeggio, you don't look at that and read the individual notes. You just know how that pattern feels. You know how to kind of get it out of your instrument. It might seem backwards, but a way that I would recommend really trying to um, work on your, your speed and your note reading too is to practice improvising. There's an app called iReal Pro. And what I do with my students is I have them, I mean, I'm not a huge jazz player, but I, I, in order to play my album, which is ironic, I needed to learn how to improvise. Um, so I took some improvised class, improvisation classes and, uh, anyways, basic improvisation, you just have to set a chord structure, like maybe take a simple blues scale, figure out what the chords are and then move with the music at the right time and learn how to sort of automatically uh, play that chord in the right spot. And then you'll, you'll kind of have it in your fingers. And then when you see it on the paper next time, it might be easier to interpret that way. So that's another sort of thought. Yeah, I think jazz improvisers are masters of patterns. They've learned so many different modes and scales. And but sometimes they're bad readers. you got to go both ways. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We need both. It sounds great. And the other thing I would say to Stuart who asked this question is um, there are practice techniques that help us assimilate patterns faster. And in the previous video that we'll have a link to down below, Sean and I talked about practicing in different rhythm patterns and other sort of smart practice strategies that help us take a difficult passage off the page and get it into our autopilot brain a little bit faster. Yeah, I think we talked a little bit about like mindful practicing too. A lot of people think if they just run something 50 times, it's gonna be good, but you kind of have to focus on what you're doing. And uh, I, to, to get my students to focus, one thing that I do is, is I say, okay, you have to do it, but you have to do it three times in a row correct. And if you make a mistake, the counter resets. So if you do it twice, it's good. And then the third time you screw it up, you've got to start over because you don't know well, you don't know well enough yet. Um, and then for really young students, I have like this little bouncing chicken that they get to watch if they get it. But <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those. I want a bouncing exactly. chicken in my studio. Sometimes oh. I use it actually. Oh, that's good. I, I'm sure you probably know that Robert Marcellus used to make his students do 10 times correctly. Ooh. So if they, in, in his studio, in his lessons, and he was a, you know, great teacher. If someone made a mistake on the ninth one, he would look at them and say, zero. Yeah, yeah, that's my most satisfying moment in a teaching day. When Back you did, to the beginning. 
Yeah. You know, though, it reminds me of a quote I once heard, and that was, uh, an amateur practices until it's right, and a professional practices until it can't go wrong. So, yeah. those three yeah. words of wisdom. <laughs> I think we all have to balance it, but you're right. Just sitting down and doing it 50 times. I so often see people repeat something over and over, repeating the same mistake. So it's kind of like they'll play the wrong note, they'll hear it, they'll switch to the right note and go on. And the next time they play it, it's wrong note, right note. So the pattern part of our brain gets really good at memorizing the wrong note, right note thing as a, as a unit. And we're not really solving the problem until we're doing it correctly. Yeah, said. and that's the problem with practicing it only until it's right. Like, let's say you did it 10 times, and nine times were wrong, and the 10th one was right. Um, when you go to sleep at night, your brain kind of encodes what you did that day, and it, it strengthens the neural pathways to the, the things that you did the most. So that's why you can just normally run upstairs without tripping. <laughs> <laughs> because your brain understands that motion, right? It can just sort of do it. It's a strengthened neural pathway. So you want to have that same thing happen for your your scales and stuff. And if you practice nine times wrong and one times right, then the next time you do it on the 11th time, you have a nine out of 10 chance of playing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably what will happen in the performance too. So that was a really good question. Very good question. All right, next question from Adrien. How do you prevent your teeth from cutting into your bottom lip, especially for a long practice session? Do you want me to start? Sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I have never, I mean, I used to be in a marching band when I was younger and we would play like, you know, eight or 10 hours a day kind of thing for every day for our, <laughs> the whole summer. Um, and at that point, I think I had some issues with that simply because it's just in contact so much. And when you're younger, your teeth are more sharp. Um, I would really be concerned that if you're cutting through your lip at all, you're not really playing with a, with a relaxed enough embouchure because you, you, unless your teeth are very sharp, there's not that enough pressure, in my opinion, to, to bust through your lip. That would be a sort of a huge problem. I would try and work on changing your technique a little bit, see if you can get without that. Um, however, some people use little dental strips to put on their teeth, um, but I find it's really annoying. And again, I think it's, a, it's sort of dressing up the problem. I'm not sure if it's a solution. Yeah, I'm going to agree that it's, it's a warning that you're falling into biting too much on the reed. And... Um, Again, just a, a reminder, if you're not sure if you're a biter, I have a good little tester, and that's to finger, register key thumb, first two fingers, leaving the next finger off, these two fingers. It's a super unstable fingering for high G sharp, and it's not a great fingering to use for the high G sharp that sits on top, top of the staff, but if you're biting at all too much, this note will squeak like crazy. It's, that's the squeak sound. What we want is a, basically a G sharp. And so it's kind of a diagnostic tool. I'm moving my fingers out of the way so you can see it, even though I wouldn't normally play with fingers curled up. Um, I recommend you try that. Now, having said that, there are times where we're put in a situation where we're playing clarinet a lot more intensely than other times. Maybe you're in a band that has a retreat weekend and suddenly you're playing six hours a day when you're used to playing one hour a day or something. And in that case, I think our muscles get tired and we tend to start to bite and then the inside of your lip can be sore. So a quick fix I use, if you have something like, um, you know, this is cleaning paper, which is basically like tissue paper that this is kind of designed to get water out of your pad if it's dripped into it. You can also take a little piece or even plain paper, and if this is my teeth, get it wet and just fold it over your teeth. And then uh, it feels very strange, but after about a minute, it'll just wrap itself around your bottom teeth, and that little bit of padding can be a lifesaver. So... I, if you're always having problems with your lip, I agree with Sean that that's masking the problem. But if you're in a situation where you're playing a lot extra, that can be um, a fix that'll help you. I actually did a whole YouTube video about this. I'll put a link to it if you need more ideas on it. One solution for me when I was in marching band is I, I switched to snare drum. <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't biting on that one, huh? No, no. <laughs> okay, great question. Next question. I started clarinet about six weeks ago. I'm hearing a fuzzy vibrating sound in the lower register, probably embouchure. Any suggestions? Okay. Um, fuzzy, if you started six weeks ago, I my first thought would be, is the instrument in good repair? Because sometimes people who are just starting, they buy something used and maybe it, you know, if you don't have a teacher yet, 
it's kind of hard to ascertain if it's really working properly. So I would get it checked out at some sort of shop just to make sure that the instrument itself is not the problem um, because it very well may be. One simple leaky pad down here, for example, um, will make like a kind of sound. And um, the fact that you're saying it's only in the low register, that would kind of, to me, hint to an instrument problem. But it also takes a little longer to develop the airstream that you can blow all the way down to those low notes on the instrument. So you might just have to do a little more practice. But ask your teacher and ask a, a music shop. That's what I would say. Yeah, those are good points. And I'll also just say, if you're very new to the instrument, um, sometimes as we get into the right hand notes, if we just look at the holes, they're much bigger holes. We might be holding our hands in a way, you might be holding your hands in a way where you're not quite covering the hole all the way. And if you have a big air leak, the note's just not gonna work. But a little tiny leak with your fingers can make it feel really resistant and it can sound airy and fuzzy. So that's a matter of looking in the mirror, checking finger position. Um, also, one of the biggest causes of an airy, fuzzy sound in any register is that our air stream is just moving a bit too slowly to really get the reed vibrating. If, if, if I'm talking like this in a real whispery tone, it's because I've let my air be very wimpy. I'm half whispering, and, and we can kind of do that on clarinet too. If I blow with really fast air, I should get a pretty clear tone. If I blow with more of a widespread mushy air stream, you'll still hear the notes, but you also hear this kind of hissing background tone. And, and of course, when we're new to it, we haven't trained our muscles how to blow with really fast air support. So increasing air speed can often really clear up our tone quality too. Yeah, and one reason exactly like she said, that the low notes, um, another reason besides them simply being bigger and harder to cover is every time you add a finger, it creates the potential for a new problem, right? So maybe your E sounds fine, but that's only involving two fingers, right? If you're playing a low F, that's nine, plus the thumb even. So, I mean, that's a lot more fingers where something could go wrong. Make sure you practice in a mirror and make sure you use the pad part of your finger, not the tip when you're... Because if you do this, you can already see like the leaking coming out, right? That, that has to be the sort of padded part. Um, one sort of test to make sure that you're covering the holes correctly, which you'd never want to play like this, by the way, but it's a good test. You just kind of squeeze lightly. And after a couple seconds of this, you just look at your hand and you look for perfectly shaped circles on there. If you get kind of like a, a mark like that, that's a sign that you're not covering the clarinet hole quite properly. But never push like that while you're playing. So. All right, yeah, so good question. I mean, there's many factors there, but I think we covered some of the big ones. Uh, Stuart had said, Michelle, love the beautiful mellow sound of your clarinet. What type of clarinet is it? Um, I and mean, there are lots of great clarinets in the world. I love this one. This is a Bakun Grenadilla clarinet with, uh, I guess it's all Bakun equipment, a MOBA called Coca-Bola barrel, which is a different kind of wood. It's um, more of a reddish color. If I hold it up close, you can see the how pretty that kind of wood is. Mm -hmm. Both Grenadilla and Coca-Bola are common clarinet woods. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, every piece of wood sounds differently. So I could probably sit down and try five Bakun Grenadilla clarinets, and they're all going to sound a little bit different. But that's, that's the fun of clarinet playing. It's, they're all good. It's interesting that you use the Coca-Bola barrel and bell. Is there a reason? Yeah, I found it just gave me... The combination of the two gave me the tone that I really liked. And I, I know they respond differently on every instrument. For me, the, um, the Grenadilla had a nice, rich, dark sound. And maybe that's because I came from years of playing Grenadilla clarinet, so it just felt more familiar. But the Coca-Bola barrel and bell added this extra kind of sparkle and resonance that I really liked. So just the combination was good. And I actually sat down and played several barrels and several bells till I found the combination that I like best. Yeah, because this one also is a, this is a Bakun, uh, this is a Bakun Beta I've just been using for some teaching stuff. But then my main instrument, should I do the same thing? This is a Clark Phobes, um, the rubber line Coca-Bola barrel. So I find the same. It's a really nice, nice tone with it. I don't know why, but it, it does sound very good. <laughs> Yeah, and I think when we're picking equipment like specialized barrels and bells, I mean, one reason to pick a barrel is if you need a different tuning length. But aside from that, then you really want to pick one that gives you the sound you best like. And every piece of wood is going to sound different. And so it's fun if you get a chance to try a whole bunch out and see what you like. All right. 
Oh, speaking of which, the next question may relate to this. It says, from Michael, Michelle, I have a clarinet pitched to 442. What length of barrel do I need to bring it down to 440? Thanks. Um, so what I would say on that is, you know, our barrel lengths obviously affect tuning and barrels are made in different lengths. Um, what he means by 442, in case you're wondering, the standard for tuning in most bands and orchestras is to tune to an A. And when you turn your tuner on, it measures the frequency of the vibration. And an A at 440, which is 440, what is it, megahertz per second or something, is um, what North America tunes to. For some reason, like when the first musicians crossed the ocean, it got lower here. A lot of European and Asian orchestras tune to 442 or 443, which is just a bit sharper. So if you have a European instrument and you're trying to play here, um, it's going to be sharp, right? So my general rule of thumb, and it would vary from barrel to barrel, is one millimeter is about 10 megahertz or one, I guess. So to go from 442 to 440, you want, you want to add two millimeters, roughly. You need to experiment with that. So if you have a 65, try a 67. That's kind of my thoughts. Sean, I don't know if you have any ideas on that. Yeah, I think, it's, I think you mean 10 hertz. 10 megahertz would be pretty fast. <laughs> but that's yeah, okay. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, that's, I know there's some numbers in there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah but... Um, that is, that's all true. I, I wish that you'd stated um, what your original what measurements were because like it, I don't know if it's for an A clarinet or a B flat clarinet or if it's for mm -hmm. like a, I think there's a model of Yamaha clarinet called like a CSG, which has, for some reason, they, they have like a 56 millimeter barrel and then a longer uh, top section. I don't really know why. I've never really played oh, it or anything. Interesting. So it might be interesting to know what you currently have. I'm willing to bet that you currently have either a 65 or a 66 millimeter barrel and that it, it, it is a, uh, um, that's kind of like a standard length for that instrument. So you could just try a millimeter longer than that, but also you might want to check your mouthpiece because we don't know what kind of mouthpiece you have. And if the mouthpiece is higher pitched, um, you might want to go to a longer barrel anyways. So like if your mouthpiece is tuned to 442 and the standard barrel length for your instrument is 66, Maybe you could try 67 and that would let you kind of have the pitch that you want. Um, so, but also make sure you're not biting. <laughs> Lots of factors go into <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he implies his clarinet itself was tuned high. So then I think mm. you're right. It's barrel and mouthpiece that are going to help bring that down. Yeah. All right. Next question. When I tongue, my tongue moves so much that I can see movement in my neck. I have difficulty keeping a high tongue position and minimizing movement of tongue without compromising sound quality. So I, it sounds to me, Dennis, like it, you're not feeling comfortable with the tonguing. It's feeling awkward. And here's one thing I'm going to say is when we move our tongue, we can see it in our throat a little bit. But if we see a lot of movement, that's actually useful information because it usually means that we're stopping blowing between every note and then refilling. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. Um, when we tongue, it's a really common but not so great clarinet habit to use a separate puff of air for every note. So let's say I'm just trying to tongue quarter notes. If I go and, and stop blowing at the end of each note and restart my air, it, it causes uneven tone and it's like speaking like this, makes the music kind of jerky. And so I will look for that in students by watching their throat. So um, let me play the way I was just doing it where I'm gonna stop blowing on every note. You can see this better from the side, I believe. You can kind of see, I don't know how much that's coming through, but you can see my throat expanding on each note. Whereas if I'm blowing steadily, you won't see much movement here. And so it might be that what you're not noticing is that your air is very uneven when you're tonguing, and that would cause notes to feel resistant to come out, especially in the high register. It might cause you to squeak because you're doing so much change for every note. Um, so that's something to consider. You know, Sean, do you have any comments on that before we... Yeah, I agree completely. I think it, exactly like you just said, I think it's probably a, a problem with either the airstream or like the fact that the airstream is stopping. You're kind of tonguing with your diaphragm. You don't realize it. Um, because saying that you can see your tongue moving in your neck is kind of like saying you can see your tongue moving in your elbow. Like it's not, it's not in there, right? 
So your tongue is in your mouth and there's actually, I could see maybe your chin moving as you try to tongue, but I don't think you could actually see the movement of the tongue in the throat. I think that comes from somewhere else. So um, you talk about minimizing the movement of the tongue. You have to realize that, that uh, I once heard someone refer to musicians as athletes of the small muscles. And I kind of like that. Um, and that's kind of how I'm viewing my recovery from my injury that those who don't know, I injured myself pretty badly. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm working with, with tools that are allowing me to get my motion back. And it's not even like I can move my finger, right? But I maybe can't move it very precisely yet. So it's a tough thing. But anyway, so you're kind of starting from that point with your tongue. Maybe it hasn't been trained yet to be used that way. Um, ironically, the tongue is a very strong uh, muscle and it's used all the time for talking. You just kind of have to learn how to sort of tame it and utilize it for, for musical uh, use. So do try to have it, if this is your read, when you're tonguing, you want it to go very small distance. You don't want to like, you know, be doing this kind of like, some people do sort of like an ice cream cone lick and it's moving a long way and it's moving past and it's, you know, all over the place. I, I recommend personally keeping it a little higher like this and then you can keep it close and that also helps the airstream get into the instrument. I find with a low tongue position, one of the problems for most people is the air kind of does this and has to wave into the clarinet. Um, but I know that a lot of people also use a, a low tongue position as well. So that would be my thoughts. Yeah, and I'm personally, I'm an advocate of high tongue position most of the time on clarinet, at least if you're wanting kind of our classical music clarinet sound, the one most people go for. Lower tongue is great when you're wanting to scoop pitch and sound and much more common in jazz or klezmer clarinet playing, but for basic classical sound, high. Um, and I have people just practice speaking, T, 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 where they think of moving their tongue as little as possible. So the, the he helps get our tongue into a good high position, T, T, T. And sometimes even speaking right into their clarinet, which feels ridiculous, but kind of gives you a feel for what you want your tongue to do. And it just takes getting used to. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to go back for one second. I was thinking more about that Hertz question we were talking about. I think I might've said it wrong too. So let's just define that. So we're, we're trying to say that by, by adding a millimeter or taking away a millimeter to the barrel, it changes by about two Hertz at a 440, right? Well, I'm saying when I'm I look, confused. I'm betting I people know. are confused. <laughs> okay, yeah, not to confuse it. Here's what I've noticed. Here's my tuner, right? It's trying to read at 440, and it has like minus 20 and plus 20. I find one millimeter tends to make about 10 of those difference, whatever that is. Oh, cents. Cents. That's what I meant. Cents. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, okay, that's what I get. Because 10 cents ends up translating into about, well, I think it's two hertz. Okay. At, at 440. But remember that if you play at a different pitch, like 880, all of a sudden that's four hertz, right? And that's just the way the music kind of works. But anyways, just to clear that up, I, I think, yeah, I was thinking about, I thought you might've meant sense. Yeah, thank you. That was my, there we go. okay, lack of clarity. <laughs> lack I, of, I, I corrected you, I was like, oh no, 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 it's 10 hertz. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense either. What am I talking about? This is the value of having both of us here. Yeah. Exactly. We can confuse each other. <laughs> exactly. All right, now I'm so confused. I'm going to go to the next question. Um, from Linda, I cannot use a metronome, just too distracting, but I do like to play with play along CDs and other CDs, um, and they often don't play some notes as they are written. Um, yeah, so a couple issues there. This idea of a metronome drives me crazy. That's true for some people. I find some people, they find it so distracting, and there's just no way they can match this external noise to what's happening with their body. Um, Having said that, I think a metronome is a really useful tool for many, many purposes. And if I have a student who just finds it so awful and distracting, I usually encourage them, encourage them to get more used to it. And so we do some little exercises. Um, one of them is to not have their clarinet going, but to help their body get more used to the metronome. So it's to turn on a metronome, uh, which I'm doing right now. Hopefully it's very annoying near my microphone here. And um, I'll have them just listen. And can you hear this, Sean, my metronome? Yeah. Okay. And as weird as this is, just tap it on their body, in different parts of their body. And so we're kind of, um, by hitting different parts of our body, my legs I can hit, my shoulders, um, I'm stimulating my brain and from many different parts of nerve endings, and it helps us internalize that rhythm a bit. And then I'll have them try 
me be tapping twice as fast as the metronome. So my metronome, hit, 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 maybe hit, 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 hit. I'm trying to go twice as fast. And I just kind of am playing with that idea of the rhythm. And then I might try taking a look at some music that's in front of me and trying to clap the rhythm of my music along with that beat. So if I had quarter notes, I'm just clapping in time. Maybe I have something that goes back and forth. But it's to kind of make a game. My clarinet's not even involved in this. It's um, getting my, literally my body used to feeling that pulse and it starts to build new neural connections in our brain to help us to be more aware of that relationship of rhythm and how our body moves. And so we're exaggerating big body movements, but in a way, when we're playing clarinet, we're doing those little movements with our fingers, right? The master of little movements, as you said, Sean. And I think um, becoming friends with your metronome is really, really handy. So experimenting with all kinds of different rhythms, especially rhythms related to music you're playing, then turn on your metronome with your clarinet and initially just take one pitch and just play along with it. Ta, 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 and then play twice as fast. Ta, ta, ta. And it starts to become not so much a foreign distraction, but something your brain is used to integrating. Yeah, I, I think that's all really good. And I have some thoughts about that too. Um, I, I agree in many ways that the metronome is very important. Um, and I think that maybe what the problem is that you do have one of those sort of digital metronomes and you just can't stand the sound. And I can totally understand that you might not enjoy practicing with that. So what I'd recommend is getting an acoustic metronome, which actually has a, a physical uh, ticking device that makes a nice kind of more pleasing click sound. Um, you can try that. But the problem of saying that the metronome itself is too distracting, um, unfortunately, that's kind of a problem because that means to me that a conductor is too distracting. Someone else you're playing with is too distracting um, in a way that you can't be flexible as a musician to work with that. So the one thing that the metronome really kind of helps you train to do is to work with an external time source and internalize that. Okay. So um, if you can't play with the metronome, then you may not realize it, but when you take the metronome away, it might feel better, but it's probably not better. It's probably just the same. And you're just allowing yourself to sort of uh, have a lot of inconsistencies, which are not made obvious when the metronome's not turned on, right? So that's my thought with that. I know it's maybe not the answer you wanted to hear. Um, and then a lot of people will practice, like there's tracks. I have a whole CD of tracks of drum grooves which have sort of some subdivisions in there, you know, like that might be more fun to practice with your scales with or something. Um, and you can kind of hear a little bit of subdivision in there, but the same thing can start happening. You can start really disguising your mistakes, right? And uh, the metronome itself, like it might in itself be sort of an a musical way to play, but it, it sort of lets you set the rules rhythmically so you can break them later. Um, without that, you can't really internalize the pulse. But it's worth noting that, of course, we didn't always have metronomes. And I think it was Beethoven 3, there's some movement in there which is actually designed to mock metronomes. I can't remember which one it is. Um, but when it first came out, it was like a, a mockery of the, or maybe it was Haydn. I can't remember, I'll have to look into that. But there's a symphony where there's like a movement that mocks, you know, through musical comedy, they kind of made fun of the idea of a metronome. Um, and there's actually a piece called... I think it's by Zanakis, which is, which is for a hundred metronomes. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it has, you put all these metronomes on and then they just kind of click forever and then, and then sort of stop. But anyways, sounds, now we're digressing. It sounds like Linda's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't go see that piece, but yeah. sure, now we're kind of digressing into total nonsense. Well, but, but that's the main idea is like it, a metronome, look at it like someone you're trying to play a duet with. Yeah. And it might be more reasonable <laughs> to work with. It's a very handy tool, and, I, and I, I think it's nice you mentioned the manual metronomes. You can also have things like, um, you know, this is an app I have where you can see it, and if you do it on an iPad or something, it's huge numbers. Or there's, there's tactile metronomes, which you clip onto your, your arm or your shoulder that actually pulse on your body, and, and sometimes those work better for people, so you can experiment a little bit. Yeah, um, Cork has a new one that actually fits in your ear. Um, which is kind of cool, I thought. And they actually allow you to sync up between players. It's sort of a good concept executed badly, though, because they, like, let's say you want to go to a song that has a click track, those four metronomes, you, you sync them up beforehand, then you play it. But if you want to sync them up again, you actually have to physically touch them to get the right thing. Oh. So you'd have to 
go up to your band members and like cheers your, your little metronomes together. Anyways, but that's something you can put in your ear maybe too. It'll kind of put it right there a little softer than having it loud in the room. Yeah. But there's lots of metronomes. There's like hundreds and hundreds. And I agree with you. They're very revealing. It's more comforting to play without them, but then we just end up slowing down in hard bits and speeding up in easy bits without being aware of it. Um, I remember I was in a film recording session where we did have click tracks in our ear and, and when you're filming a movie soundtrack, it has to be exactly a set time because it has to fit, you know, 12 seconds on screen. And I remember the principal oboe player who's just a master musician, one of the best, you know, he held up his hand. And he said, there's something wrong with my click track. And the sound engineer was all worried that he couldn't hear it. And he ran over, he goes, no, 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 it's not that I can't hear it. It's just that it always speeds up in this really hard part here. <laughs> <laughs> I just started laughing because that's what it feels like. It's like, oh my god, this part that's hard. All of a sudden, the click is going faster. But yeah, it's really funny. It was good. It was a, a good move. Okay, Actually, moving on. Just to yeah. touch on that for one more second, there is an example of why you need to be able to play with a metronome because I've had similar instances playing live gigs to a click track. I mean, it's not enough just to put up my hand and say, "Excuse me, um, I know I'm getting paid handsomely for this gig, and I'm supposed to be a professional, but I just really hate playing with a metronome." They would. You know, like, what? You have to do this. Yes. You have to play. Yeah, what are you doing, right? Like, um, and you can be responsible. Like, one time I was playing, I also played percussion um, sometimes uh, in, in settings like that. I was up in Edmonton playing some concert uh, for, I don't remember what it was exactly, but I was playing snare drum, and I literally had to be the driving force behind everybody. If I wasn't playing with that metronome, nobody would be. And uh, it's just the way it is. So you, you got to get used to it. That being said, though, I think you should maybe make a separation between your, your practice and your playing for pleasure. Um, too many people, they play, they, get, they sit down and they play through a song that they like, and then they call that practicing, but that's more just playing, right? Um, for maybe, maybe for your practice, put the metronome on. For your playing, you can keep it off and sort of just enjoy the music and the sounds that you're making, and you might put it on just to sort of test yourself, but you don't necessarily need to interact those two constantly and it is good to turn the metronome off after you've practiced with it but make sure you're actually practicing with the metronome all right good point next question how much clicking of keys is normal perhaps my clarinet needs an overhaul but i'd rather not pay for that unless it will help <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts sean on this one well that goes back to the whole professionalism thing i remember ed joffe was telling her yeah, Ed Joffe was telling me about this. For those who don't know, I had a three-episode-long podcast chat with him. He's one of the best doublers in New York City. He plays, like, every woodwind instrument under the sun, well, every single reed and, and flute. And uh, he was saying that it's ironic because back in the 40s and 50s when, when there was a lot of sort of jazz groups and, and people were full-time session players like Eddie Daniels in studio orchestras, um, zero key click was acceptable. And if there was any key click, the engineers would put up their hand and go, hey, we got some clicking on that tenor sax in row three, like, what's going on? Fix that, you know? But nowadays, um, there's less of that, and people sort of let their instruments go a little bit. Um, if, you're, if it's clicking, it, it, I would say you get some, some uh, key oil, and you really should be oiling your keys. I mean, it depends on what you're playing and how dry it is, but you really should be oiling your keys. I remember I asked Peter Spriggs on another episode um, what his – biggest pet peeve was with with clarinets when he gets them for overhauls and and he said you know could people at least oil their keys like once <laughs> between <laughs> like it's and it's true because with clarinet you have you know maybe right here i don't know if you can see this key but there's the key when you push it it moves right but then this little thing inside is is either a rod or a pin of some sort you can't really see it but when those two pieces are both metal and they move together and they're all gunked up with dirt and dust, it, it ruins the inside of the, the rods and stuff. So it's got to be lubricated. And then when it's lubricated, it will be less noisy. So um, it's very possible it might need an overhaul if it's, if it's old or it's been a while. I mean, you kind of should get your clarinet overhauled every couple of years, whether you want to or not. Um, <laughs> and then... Also, just make sure it's, it's well-maintained. You would never ride a bicycle that you've never oiled the chain on, right? So it's kind of like that. And Sean, just in case someone's watching who's never oiled their keys, how do you do it? What's your sort of... get something. Okay. And so while Sean is getting the key oil, I'm going to just uh, mention one other thing to 
about that. Um, I also think if we're hearing a lot of key clicks, one of the questions just to check in is, are you hammering like crazy on the clarinet? Because if your clarinet's in good adjustment, if you're hammering it like crazy, I mean, I, I can hear the sound of me just slapping my bell, right? And um, so it might just be a clue to check. That as a rule, we want our fingers to come down pretty gently so that if I'm just playing, you know, here I'm gonna put right up against my mic, you shouldn't hear a lot of action. Um, so that's another thing. If I'm hammering, you're going to hear all kinds of key click that's percussive, and that's different. This is not a percussion instrument. Um, anyway, Sean, you have your tool there. Let's go back to oil. Yeah, absolutely. So what I use, and, you know, again, people use all sorts of different stuff. There's probably a hundred ways to do this. Um, but a lot of people buy those little tiny bottles of dropper from, you know, specialized music companies. But really all those droppers are is a bunch of this that is put into a tinier bottle and resold at 50 times the cost. So this is... Uh, uh, 75 W 90 gear oil and you can buy a, a container of this this is an entire quart or almost a thousand milliliters and this is about seven bucks and this is enough to last me and all of my students probably till the end of the century um, because all you need to do is you take the little cap I won't do it now but you take the little cap here you put a little tiny bit of gear oil in here and then I like to use a pin like this you dip it in there's not really a drop on there right now, but you, ideally you'd have a little drop of oil and then you get your clarinet and every single spot where there's metal that meets like this, you would drop the, 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 the key oil on and then move the, the, um, the key or whatever it is around a little bit and let that kind of wick inside of the mechanism. Um, I would do that on every single spot that, there's movement and I would do it as you know maybe every three months maybe every six months whatever it kind of needs and that's how um, you can go along afterwards and obviously clean up any excess but you really shouldn't be putting on enough that really makes a mess um, but it's worth noting that sometimes you actually have to clean the rods before you oil them because they might have a bunch of dust built up right and the dust just like when your car needs an oil change um, that's what starts to cause problems too. It's not enough that there's oil in there. The oil might be dirty, right? So when you take the rods out, I think people use cigarette lighter uh, fluid um, or cleaner or something like that, but that might be a job for your repair person. Just take out those rods and get them all cleaned up and, and get it working like that. But I hope that kind of helps. I, that's what I use is this gear oil and it's, it's very cheap. It's like I said, it'll just last forever. What, what do you use? Yeah, I was taught with motor oil. I sometimes use just mineral oil. And I agree with you that, I don't know if this will close up, the amount of oil, I don't think my camera can focus on this, I'm dipping it in, is literally the tiniest yeah, bead. Yeah, there it is. There it is, like a tiny, tiny bead. And any of those joints where you see that little, uh, this little ball, you know, then I just touch it on that spot uh, where there's a ball meeting the rod and it and it sort of goes right in there and that way I'm not going to be spilling extra oil onto the clarinet, which we don't want, but um, Yeah, I think it's great and many people don't know about that Very important. I would recommend definitely doing that. <laughs> yeah. Now. There's also a few things where um, You know depending on your clarinet There's places where clarinets tend to have like felt built in to keep metal from hitting metal So if you have somewhere where you have bare metal clacking against bare metal you probably either have a bent key or you've lost a cork or a felt or something that's designed to um, keep it from clicking. So that that's just a little repair issue. Yeah, this instrument right now has that issue. I need to fix it, um, but I just haven't bothered. So if I press this key, I don't know if you can hear it, but but if this key is pressed down and then I press it, it doesn't make that. So that's because this little key actually, the felt is worn out. And once I repair that felt, it will no longer clack like that. But until I do, there's no way to get around it with key oil or whatever else you want to do. So that's where the general rep repair comes into it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of points on the instrument where there's little pads that are meant to sort of silence or reduce the amount of noise that come out. And uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting actually. Yeah. All right. That was a good question. Very good. All right. Yeah. Next question. Oh, okay. I'm going to put this to you, Sean, first. <laughs> How do you go about making your music more musical versus metronomic or flat, et cetera? There's this great supplement you can buy and no, <laughs> for $10,000. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll sell it actually. It's, uh... <laughs> um, I don't know. That is kind of an interesting question. Um, 
you really have to sort of discover the phrase and kind of find what you want to say with it a little bit. And uh, I don't think there's really like a magic trick and, and music is kind of subjective also, but uh, I, I really think you need to understand the phrasing of the piece and kind of what you want to get out of it to sort of say what it needs to say. Um, and doing things like really accentuating your dynamic differences can help because sometimes you think you're doing something like you, it, just because it says on the paper, pianissimo and then fortissimo, um, you know, whether you think of those as soft and loud or weaker or stronger or whatever, I mean, try to imagine that there's someone across the room who is dictating what you're doing, but they're not just writing down the notes, they're writing down the rhythms and they're writing down the dynamics and everything. And are you conveying what's on the paper to those people? And uh, also, I would just say read between the lines. I mean, if you interpret literally exactly what's on the paper, you're going to become kind of computerized, right? So try to, to put the humanity that you can into the, the piece. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, phrasing and, and expression is the heart of music, and it's probably what attracted most of us to music in the first place. It's such an emotional expression and any mute any mute that uh, I can't speak any movie that has beautiful emotional music um, the music definitely enhances it so I, I agree with Sean we need to find our own voice and sometimes I'll just ask my students to sing a phrase even if you're just singing it to yourself where no one else can hear um, just like two great actors would do Hamlet differently but but potentially very effectively every musician is going to interpret a phrase a little bit differently and if you sing it to yourself yeah, you might be able to analyze it. Well, where do I feel like the peak note of this little phrase is? And you sing it to yourself and it becomes quite clear. And I'll often have my students sing, you know, the, the basic classical phrase, if we really simplify it. And of course, there's many exceptions, but often a phrase will start softly, it'll grow to a peak and it'll come down. And we do need to, when we're first really working on phrasing, to exaggerate that. Because often what comes out of our clarinet is different from what we're hearing inside of our body. Recording yourself really helps. Just record it, listen back, and say, wow, I thought I was crescendoing here, but it really doesn't sound like it. Maybe I need to do more. Um, a lot of times we tend to start notes too loudly when we want to start softer, so practicing how you start a phrase on a slow, beautiful piece. Clarinet can go very soft. It's always a nice trick to kind of fade out as much as we can. So there's kind of some – ironically, there's mechanical things we need to do to not sound like a mechanical player. We want it to sound like it's flowing effortlessly, but to get there, there is some very mechanical things we need to do um, just to make sure our instrument's not having some notes jump out unexpectedly and that we're very intentional on in where we're crescendoing and where we're diminuendoing. So you have to know what you want to do with it. Yeah, I think that the visual is, or sort of, the, I guess it's not visualization, but like, I guess it's auditory visualization, like knowing what sound you want to come out and, and hearing it in your head is so important. So sometimes to put down the, the clarinet, stop blowing on it and sort of, you can just finger along if you want, but hear what you'd like it to sound like in your head while you're, while you're, um, you know, kind of playing, right? But don't blow any air through. And then when you try it the next time, you, you might emulate that. But if, if you go to, to kind of do that and you can't hear anything in your head, then that concept's probably not being conveyed because it's not really there in the first place, right? Um, it, it'll start to come naturally to you. I mean, it, it, going back to language, like if I just read this sentence right now, how do you go about making your music more, like it's very dry and very kind of, uh, you know? So, but that's with normal speech, you learn to do this. Like, how do you go about making your music more musical? asking it as a question like that and sort of having the peaks and valleys and even that little sentence goes a long way to sort of explaining how to do it with the piece, right? So identify the phrases, figure out what they are, and along with doing something within the entire phrase, also try to do something within each note. Someone once said to me, um, I don't know who it was, sorry, but um, something like the notes and rhythms uh, might make up the music, but it's what happens between them that that is the music, and I, I kind of like that. So if that's not too abstract, maybe you could think of that too. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. All right, great question. Next question. Have you noticed any issue with synthetic reeds in tuning 
When I've tried them in the past, uh, example, Legere Signature European, I've experienced a, notice, a notable flatness, especially around the throat tones. My teacher has noted this as well, just wondering if this is something others have experienced. And, you know, we had a long discussion about synthetic reads on the last interview that we did, the live one, and so you can hear more about that, um, which we won't duplicate now. But I will say that um, I have heard that from a few players, and I think on some mouthpieces that's emphasized more than others. So again, this is a matter of trying stuff out, seeing what works on your equipment. I've heard, and I'm not totally clear on the facts on this, but some of the mouthpieces that Bakun Company makes that are designed to work with the synthetic reeds um, do have some tuning considerations that they do tend to play a bit lower. When I throw the European Legere reeds on my clarinet, it does tune a little bit lower. I don't find it um, troublesome, but it's a little bit lower than my cane reeds. And I think every mouthpiece is going to respond differently to them. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things about synthetic reeds is, is get, uh, getting used to the fact that they're not cane reeds. So you might have to voice things a little bit differently. They, they, they feel a bit different in your mouth. They might require different amounts of pressure than, than the cane at different times. Um, so I found if I have a strength that's correct for me, and if I'm accommodating properly, I don't really get too many tuning issues. Um, that being said, I, I do know that um, Legere actually designed their own mouthpiece a while back to go specifically with their reeds. I don't think it was selling all that well, so I think it's been discontinued. Um, but they were trying to sort of match the, the, the properties of their reeds to a mouthpiece as opposed to try and match the reeds to the existing mouthpieces. So there probably is some sort of difference, but, but it's, uh, it's about being flexible and, and learning to manage it and, and, and deal with it. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, next question. Oh, we're just about finished with our questions here. In fact, this is the last one I have on the list. When tuning on middle B, so I'm assuming that's all fingers down. In summer, I've pulled out a little. I found that the lower register is then flat. Is it correct to tighten the embouchure to raise the pitch in the lower register? What do you mean by in summer, do you know? Is that like a I'm not sure actually maybe if she was at a music camp or something I don't know or or maybe in a hot place oh yeah <laughs> fair enough um, yeah so this goes I think we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of tuning from different areas on the instrument um, a lot of times it's best I think to just sort of tune from one place here at the barrel most people do that they'll they'll tune at that spot um, but that unfortunately affects all of the notes in the instrument because you're pulling out before all of the notes, right? So in certain circumstances, and in my opinion, there better be a pretty good reason for it, but you can tune at the bell and you can also tune at the, um, between the two joints. But uh, I would say that, again, that this has to be a pretty good reason for that because there's certain clarinets like Rossi instruments, which are actually designed as solid wood pieces and you, you can't do that. So usually, Issues like that are a sign of some other problem, but if you, if you insist, you can pull out just a hair here, and that will help the pitch on these notes be, be lower without affecting these ones at all. So that's one kind of way to do it. But, you, you know, sometimes you pull out one place and, okay, let's say you fix the problem in the upper register, like for the high E, that, okay, maybe it was sharp. Now the, the low A, it might be flat because the, the way the clarinet kind of works, right? Um, so... Uh, again, I would think it's more about the voicing and kind of making sure that the note comes out as it's in your head. But uh, if you if you must, you can adjust in several spots. Yeah, and I think I, I think you need to get to know your own instrument, what the tuning tendencies are. Um, but that idea of in summer does sort of raise a good issue that you might not be aware of, which is that the warmer our instrument gets, the sharper it goes. And so if you're playing in a hot room, maybe it's a hot summer day with a room with no air conditioning and you have 60 musicians in there, um, your instrument overall is going to go sharper, which then might need, mean you might need to pull more than you normally would in normal tuning conditions. Or if you're in a cold room, your instrument's going to play flatter. So we need to be aware of that. When we pull up the barrel, it not only affects everything, it affects our left hand notes more than it affects our right hand notes. So I'm a little concerned when you say, is it correct to tighten the embouchure to raise pitch in the lower register? I mean, a little bit, we do that to fine tune notes, but you don't want to have your instrument tuned to where 
that one tuning note your band does is perfect and then like 10 other notes are way too flat because that's just going to be frustrating and you're going to end up biting too much. So yeah, sometimes a little bit of a pull here will affect those right hand notes and it might be also if you're always pulling your barrel, then you should look at having a longer barrel that's going to balance the overall tuning a little better than just pulling your existing barrel out will do. And that might take care of some of those tuning inconsistencies between registers. Yeah, when you pull out just the barrel, or when you pull out any part actually, um, there's a little tiny, like you can't really see it, but it ends up looking kind of like, uh, uh, I wish I could draw it. It creates a gap all the way around the instrument, right? So some people use a tuning ring to fill in that gap. And a lot of people, you should know that there's actually about a quarter millimeter gap built into the clarinet. So some people will put a quarter millimeter tuning ring inside the middle joint to help sort of uh, increase the power and, and of those notes on the lower half anyways, which is kind of interesting. I, I did try it. It does work. Um, one more thing. I think I figured out your question a little bit better. I think what you're saying is, just like Michelle said, she made me think of this, you're tuning on that note in the orchestra or the band or whatever, probably the orchestra if it's a, if it's a B because it's a concert A that you're tuning to. I don't know many bands that tune on a concert A, but, um, and then you find the lower register is flat when you pull out. Well, something like a low F is rather flat anyways on most clarinets. That's why on the Tosca you have that extra F finger and on the, like the Bakun, um, I don't know if you have this, Michelle, but there's like an extra vent mechanism on some of them. Yeah, it's on the MOBAs, yeah. Yeah, so on some of them, you'll have like an extra vent to try and bring that, that note up to pitch. Um, so, but yeah, if you've pulled out the upper register to bring that B in tune, then yeah, the lower register is gonna be more flat because it's, it's the opposite and it kind of, the problem flips in the different partials. So, um, you do probably have to put a little more pressure and different voicing on the lower note. But if you pull out too much, then you're going to have to go too far. And it's going to be, you know, we go back to the biting issues and cutting through your lip and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. But it, it's unfortunately not an easy, <laughs> not a quick, easy fix. Yeah. So that was a really nice range of questions. You know, we had everything from basic tone production to how do we practice to how do we articulate better to metronomes to tuning I mean that covers so many things that are of value to so many clarinetists so I really appreciate everyone who was on the live call who sent us those questions and I know they're of value to many many players um, also wanted to mention one of the things that we talked about on our uh, live broadcast was that we were doing a mini fundraiser for the Clarinate podcast. You know, Sean puts hours and hours into this great clarinet content that's kind of just available for free for all of us. And so I had offered up a, a special link, which we will put in the replay or in the notes right underneath this video, um, that I have some sample lessons from some courses and stuff. And if you want to go deeper and, and really fine tune your articulation or your tone or some other aspect of it, I have some courses and 50% of the proceeds would go to support the Clarinate podcast. Sean mentioned his injury, which I cringe at. He showed a picture of a bunch of glass that got embedded in his palm, very, very serious injury. And that's keeping him from some of his normal, um, activities that would normally be helping support the podcast. So I would like to see the clarinet community supporting this. So check the link below for information on that. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think that you can try the course for, for a couple of videos from it for 30 days. Is that the, the situation? Well, you know, the way that it works is I, I want to make sure it's a good fit before someone even commits. So um, when you look at the link we have, you can sign up for some free sample videos. So you just put your name and email address and for about a week, you'll get at least three samples from the course. You kind of get a taste of it. And then once you register for it, you have 30 days, 100%, 100% refund. So if you then get in there and it's not right for you, no problem. I have to say it's very rare that someone doesn't find value because they've already recognized if it's a good fit by going through some of those uh, free lessons that you get with it. But absolutely, I, I, I want to, my mission is to make sure it's a good fit and it's helping people out. Another way you can help out the podcast, um, if you're interested, I have a couple ways on the website. So if you go to clarineat.com slash support, I'd really appreciate it if you check that out. Um, the easiest way is a lot of people do their shopping on Amazon. Um, if you click on the Clarineat Amazon link before you do your Amazon shopping, then a small percentage will go towards helping create free content for the Clarinet community at no extra charge to you. So it's a really good way to, uh, to do that. And I'm gonna put um, the 
Clarinet Mentors courses on the website. It'll be under the store on the tab called Lessons. So if you go to clarinet.com, mouse over the store icon, then it'll show up with a little tab where you can click Lessons, and uh, you can check it out there. And I really appreciate uh, Michelle extending this, this offer to help support the production of this content. Yeah, that sounds great. So, Sean, this was really fun. I've really enjoyed our, our back and forth uh, broadcast. Maybe maybe we can schedule another live one at some point in the future. Oh, motor oil. Get yeah. Beer oil, people. I'm drinking tea. Sean's <laughs> drinking motor oil. And I don't know. Just kidding. It's in here. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. yeah, I really enjoyed this. I, thanks for including me in the Clarinet Mentors uh community it's great to see this so, it's so active i'm really impressed with all the involvement from people and they seem so appreciative and uh talented and asking good questions and it's really great to see so keep it up hey and to all of you who are watching this video uh we'd love to hear from you so you can enter your comments in the comments box underneath this video if you have questions for future broadcasts um Feel free to write them in there and Sean and I can collect them and uh, that might motivate us to schedule another live broadcast at some point down the road. Absolutely. So, that was a lot of fun. Goodbye, everybody.